our grandparents knew the chestnut tree. We did not, but our grandchildren will know it again. Welcome to Manage This, the podcast by project managers for project managers. Every couple of weeks, we meet to talk about how people like you are managing projects, both big and small. Our guests include speakers, authors, and trainers, but also those who are right there in the trenches, getting the stuff of project management done on a daily basis. I'm your host, Nick Walker. And before we get to today's guest, we are thrilled to acknowledge the return of one of the founding fathers of this podcast, (laughs) Andy Crow, back from well, I, I guess the project of a lifetime. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, um, we've we taken a short break. The boat, which is named Gratitude, is in Grenada right now. We've sailed it from Florida all the way down through the Caribbean, down to Grenada, which is really close to uh, South America, and are waiting out hurricane season there. Well, we're going to talk with you more in detail about uh, your adventure in the next podcast. But Great. Uh, Let's meet our guest. Professor William A. Powell is the director of the American Chestnut Research and Restoration Program. Dr. Powell received his Ph.D. in 1986 at Utah State University, studying ways to bring back the American chestnut tree, a tree that became functionally extinct after being devastated by a fungus from Asia. Approximately 90% of the nearly 4 billion trees were killed by blight. In 1989, he became a faculty member at the State University of New York's College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse, New York. There, he began collaborating with his colleague, Dr. Charles Maynard, and the American Chestnut Foundation, researching methods to develop a tree resistant to the blight. He's worked for the last three decades to reintroduce the American chestnut to the wild, and their efforts are succeeding. Dr. Powell, so great to have you with us. Welcome to Manage This. Thank you. Let's start off the conversation by learning more about your career path and how you became passionate about the American chestnut tree. So like most people, when I was younger, I actually hadn't heard about the American chestnut. You know, it's been gone for a while. But when I went to uh, graduate school, I was very fortunate to get into Dr. Neil Van Alphen's lab. And there we worked on the fungus that causes chestnut blight. And that's where I kind of learned the chestnut story. And it's a fascinating story the American chestnut was once one of the most common trees in the Eastern Forest, and we lost it in about 50 years. So from that point, as a graduate student, I started learning about it, got very passionate about it. I had a little sabbatical from working with chestnuts while I was a postdoc, but I had the opportunity to get back to the chestnut research here at the uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and the rest is history. There's probably not an American who isn't familiar with the word chestnut, anyway, the mm-hmm. concept of, of chestnuts. We sing about it at Christmas, it, don't yes, we? Every yeah. Christmas, yeah. And the poetry under the spreading chestnut tree, it's embedded in our culture. But let's talk about what happened to the American chestnut tree and the impact this has had on the environment, where once it flourished. Yeah, so a little over a century ago, the American chestnut was so common, people used to say a squirrel can travel from Maine to Florida and never leave a chestnut tree. Hmm. Um, about within its range, about one out of every four trees were American chestnuts. And what happened was people started importing Asian chestnut trees and for a number of reasons, for ornamentals, for agriculture. When that happened, people didn't realize at that time that not only are they bringing over a tree, but they're bringing all the microbes that are on that tree. And it turned out there was this one fungus on that tree called Cryphonectria parasitica that caused a minor blight on the Chinese chestnuts. But when it came here to the United States and jumped off into American chestnuts, which never seen this blight before, it was devastating. And um, it was first discovered in 1904. And by the 1950s, it had gone through the whole range, killing around 3 billion, some of our largest trees in the forest. And Dr. Powell, I have a question for you along those lines. So today you have a range of trees do you know off the top of your head about how high a tree in the average eastern forest is? Is it 100 feet? Is it, you know, 90, 120, something like that, or shorter? Well, it depends on the species. Yeah. But, um, yeah, a lot of them will go over 100 feet in height. Okay. Out west where we have the uh, giant sequoias, right. but hmm. we have some pretty large trees here too. And so how high were the chestnuts on average back a century, or let's say 1890, you know, if you could? Right. So the mature trees would get up to 90 to 110 feet in height. You know, around that range, uh, some record ones might have gone up to 120. 
Um, there's actually a tree right now in Maine that's 100, I think it's at 115 feet in height. Wow. Uh, of the lone survivors. How many trees are still around? So, you know, we lost billions of trees, but there's still literally millions of stump sprouts still surviving in our forests. And that's a good thing because that gives us a genetic base to a restoration program. So we're not starting with just one genotype of tree. We actually have a nice base that we can work with to bring back the population. That kind of leads us into sort of the topic of our podcast is that we've gone from a time when the chestnut tree dominated the eastern forest, at least in terms of what it was used for. It fed people by the bushel full. You know, whole communities were able to eat off of chestnuts at times, you know, when they were falling. It was furniture, it was for housing, it was for everything. And then suddenly it's gone, relatively speaking. But there's a movement that you're very integral with to turn that back around. Yeah, so there's, there's a group of lay people and scientists who want to bring this tree back because it was such an important tree. Most of them are in the American Chestnut Foundation that was established in 1983. And initially they started what's called a back cross breeding program because the trees that were available at that time, the chestnut trees, were all hybrids or Chinese chestnut. Neither of those could actually survive in our forests. So the idea back then was to use a method that was also used in corn breeding to make these trees more Americanized or more adapted to our forests by crossing them with wild trees through several generations, getting rid of unwanted traits and trying to keep the resistance in as he went through it. Then, after about 1990, the New York chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation came to us at ESF and said, well, there's these new techniques out there called genetic engineering. You know, can that be applied to restoring the American chestnut? And they came to myself and Dr. Maynard, a colleague of mine here, and we said, well, we're going to give it a try. And that's kind of started our whole process with the genetic engineering. Which is different than the back crossing. So I understood at one point, because I've kept up with this for many years, I understood at one point they felt like they had back-crossed it, what was it, six or seven times, and that it was to a point that they felt like they had the characteristics of the American chestnut with the blight resistance of the the Chinese or Asian one. Is that semi-accurate? Almost, not quite. Uh, So initially when they started this program, they thought there was only two genes or two genetic loci involved Uh with the Asian resistance. They quickly found from the breeding that there was at least three major ones. And then as they went through more time, they actually find out that there could be as many as nine genetic loci, each on a different chromosome. That really complicates things. And what they've found is they think they might have lost some of the resistance genes along the way in the breeding program. And so where they are right now is they have what we call intermediate levels of resistance. So higher than the original American but not as high as the Asian parents. So they're kind of in between. And it's complicated to try to get all the right genes in there. And that's quite different than what we're doing because what we're doing is actually we take a wild American chestnut tree and we keep everything that's in there and just add in the genes we need for blight resistance. And by doing that, we end up with a tree that's blight resistant or we call it blight tolerant. And at the same time has every single allele every single gene that it originally had so it's fully adapted to our forest. So we don't have to do any back cross breeding. It acts as a dominant gene. So when we outcross to wild type trees, we can actually help rescue their genetic diversity wow. and bring it into a restoration program. Dr. Powell, how did you guys come up with this solution? I understand you're using a wheat gene to create that blight resistance. Is that right? Yeah. So it's a, it a bit of a process. Again, my background in graduate school was to look at the fungus itself and we were studying a thing called hypovirulence. Hypovirulence is when the fungus gets a virus and that virus attenuates its ability to attack the tree. So it can't attack the tree normally. And a lot of researchers have been looking at that back then and they found was that one of the key virulence factors ability to attack the tree was the production of an acid called oxalic acid or oxalate. So I learned that back as a graduate student Fast forward to when I was a faculty member here, one of our postdocs went to a plant physiology meeting and came back with a book of abstracts. And I was just leafing through that book of abstracts and I saw this one that talked about this enzyme they put in tomato called oxalate oxidase. And right there was my kind of eureka moment where um, I said, well, look, if oxalic acid is a main virulence factor needed to attack the tree, 
and this enzyme breaks it down, we need to get those two things together. Mm. And so that started the whole idea of using this particular gene in the tree. Dr. Powell, obviously this was not an overnight success. Tell us a little bit about how long this took and some of the steps involved. Yeah, it's a, it was a very long process. And in the beginning, it was very hard to get funding to get this process going too. At the time we started back in 1990, very few plants have actually been genetically engineered. Trees, especially, I think the only thing that was engineered was poplar at that time, hybrid poplar. Um, so we had to actually kind of start from ground zero and develop all the techniques um, here at ESF as well with our colleagues at the University of Georgia, Scott Merkel. And so we basically, I used to sit, tell people we had to build the boat before we went fishing. Mm -hmm. So um, that means that we had to develop all the tissue culture techniques that would allow us to put a gene in and then regenerate a plant before we start searching for the right gene. And that whole process took almost 16 years to get it really optimized where we could do it in less than a year where we could put a gene in and start testing it. So in the meantime, we actually started testing genes out in hyperpopular because that was a model system, very easy to do. And that's where we first tested the oxalate oxidase gene, showing that we can enhance resistance to another pathogen in there. And then later we put it into American chest. And so do we have examples today or samples or specimens that are blight tolerant? Yes, we do. We have uh, blight tolerant American chestnut trees now. We've had them in the field since 2000 and see, it 2006, and we've been testing them out in the field. We have like different versions, and the different versions mainly have different levels of expression, meaning how much of this enzyme can the tree make. And we're finally at the point where we have ones that are highly tolerant of light, and these are the ones we're starting to prepare, go through the regulatory process. Regulatory process. Okay. See, I was thinking you are going to say, so you guys can all go down to your nursery and just request this certain... I product wish. that we've created. <laughs> so tell us a bit about that regulatory process. Okay, so in the United States, when genetic engineering of plants first came about, they established this thing called the coordinated framework. And this is where you have three already established agencies, the USDA, EPA, and the FDA, all regulate genetically engineered plants. And the idea is that depending on their charge, at least one of them will regulate your plants. No plants would slip through. So we are actually working with them. It actually taken us some time because no university teaches about the regulatory system. So we had to kind of go past five years or so going to them, learning how the whole thing works. And right now we're getting very close to first submitting to the USDA. And we're most familiar with the USDA because they're also the ones who handle our field permits because all our plants that are tested in the field are regulated by USDA APHIS. And so they're going to be the ones that we go to first see if we can get what's called non-regulated status. And then with them and some of the other agencies, we could pass them out to the public. Dr. Powell, I've got a question for you. You know, we're project managers. We think of the world in terms of projects. And when you, oftentimes when you start a project, it's most useful to begin sort of with the end in mind. But this project will probably span several generations. What do you hope to achieve in your career? Like when you got to the end of your career, whenever that is, and hopefully it's as long as you want it to be, what would right. you hope to have uh, to have seen happen here? Because you've already made an amazing step. Yeah, we already went over some of the hurdles and, you know, just making a tree that's light tolerant was a big deal for us. But the next thing is it doesn't do us any good unless people can actually plant these trees. So the next hurdle that I really want to get through is this regulatory process. And so we're really working hard on that right now. We've done all the experiments, things like feeding leaves to insects and feeding pollen to bees and feeding leaves to wood frogs and looking at mycorrhizae on the roots, doing all those kinds of things. And now we're putting together the documentation for the review process. But that's, again, just another step. What I want to see before I leave, though, is actually see the restoration start. Right. And we actually have a plan to developing some orchards so that once we have permission, we can actually distribute trees. We don't want to you know, get the permission and all of a sudden we only have a few trees you know, in our research plots. We actually want to have production orchards. So we're planting those right now. We also want to have what's called a restoration demonstration forest set up so we can kind of show how restoration could be done and be modeled by other people. And we want to have a distribution system set up so that we start getting these out to the public. And what we'd like to do is actually the first trees go out, actually have some 
citizen scientists help us out by following those trees and maybe having a website where they can put in data and stuff from growing their trees to see how they are doing. So that's kind of what I want to do before I finally retire. <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned that you've got bees involved, you've got insects involved. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges getting this tree that's resistant to the blight into the wild. Can we talk more about some of those challenges and what really has yet to be overcome? So mostly the tests that we have done, like, again, feeding pollen to bees and wood frog stuff, that's mostly to satisfy the regulators to show that our trees have no higher risk than trees that are produced by traditional methods. And we have the logic argument that we're actually making smaller changes than traditional hybrid breeding, right. but we actually need some data. So those are what we've been doing really over the past few years. Some of the big challenges is how do you actually restore a tree? No one's ever done this before. Obviously, you have to have places to actually plant them. You don't want to go down and cut down forests to plant chestnut trees. But there are a lot of places out there, such as we're investigating mine reclamation. Those are great places to plant chestnut trees because actually that soil is usually pretty good for a chestnut. There's a lot of diseases going out there right now. We're losing trees to hemorrhoid ash borer, to hemlock oil adelgid, a thousand canker disease of walnut. So as those trees die out, you know, what are people going to plant? We could just plant more oaks, but then we might have sudden oak death come through. So, you know, there's going to be places for these things to be planted. And we got to kind of investigate what is the best method to, to have that happen. Dr. Powell, when I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about the regulatory hurdles and obstacles that you guys have to overcome, it just makes me think, okay, I guess one of their fundamental questions is, is the ecosystem prepared to reintroduce this tree, the American chestnut tree? How do you answer that question? <laughs> How do you guys that's, tackle that? That's an excellent question. And, and I get that a lot at my seminars, you know, because the chestnut up north here has been gone for over 100 years in the south for about 50 years. So is the ecology out there changed so much that the chestnut really can't fit back in there? And that really isn't the case. You got to think about evolution. You got to think about the environment. 100 years is actually just a blink in the eye hmm. for the species out there. And just kind of as an example, we did this wood frog feeding experiment where we fed our genetically engineered chestnut, wild type chestnut leaves to the wood frogs, but we also included things like sugar maple and American beech and oak. And what we found was that there was really no difference between those, whether it's transgenic or not, except for one experiment we did, and that is the rate of development. And it turned out in that one experiment, the chestnut actually did better than the sugar maple or the American beech, no matter if it was genetically engineered or not, okay? And that kind of tells us those wood frogs are still adapted to feeding off chestnut leaves. Mm -hmm. And something similar happened when Vern Sweeney, one of our colleagues, did a study with aquatic insect feeding, uh, not with our transgenics, but with a wild type, and found out that actually a lot of the aquatic insects that he looked at preferred the American chestnut over like the oaks, which have since replaced them. So the, I think the ecosystem is still sitting there ready to accept the chestnut back. So Dr. Powell, along those lines, you know, risk is a huge part of project management, evaluating risks, understanding them. What, if I can ask this, what keeps you awake at night with this whole project? Is there anything that kind of concerns you? Is it all about the regulatory? Do you feel like you're ready to go except for the regulatory hurdles? What risks concern you? So, you know, I've been working with this now over 30 years, and I don't see any environmental risks that really keeps me awake at all. I think actually this is going to be an environmental benefit. Some of the things that I worry about really is the anti-GMO movement and stuff that might try to stand in the way of this restoration program. But I hope they realize is that this is not the typical GMO, you know. This is not something that we're going to be making a profit off of. It's something that we actually want to do to benefit the environment. I mean, that's what our whole college is here for. We're the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. So, you know, I hope they start thinking a little differently that, well, maybe this is a good cause or a good case for, for using this tool, genetic engineering, especially since our forests are being threatened by so many different exotic pests and pathogens. It's my understanding that there is some opposition, though, to some of what you're doing. People who are basically perhaps against genetic engineering at all. Some people saying we shouldn't be introducing these trees back into the ecosystem. How do you respond to your critics? 
So mostly, again, this is kind of a different situation. And we've actually had some of our colleagues do surveys and stuff with the public. And there's actually a lot more acceptance of a genetically engineered chestnut tree than a lot of the genetically engineered crops. So we have a little bit of advantage there. But I would try to tell them that if you really want to have a tree that's going to be adapted to our forests, genetic engineering is actually the best tool to use, much better than back crossbreeding or hybridization, because you're not bringing in all these extra traits that did not evolve in this part of the world. They evolved on the opposite side of the globe. They are not adapted to our forests. So if you really want something that's going to be able to actually fulfill its ecosystem services, this is the way to go. And that's why I try to convince them. Some people don't like it because they say, well, it's not natural, but it is really natural because genetic engineering actually happens in a wild. If your definition of natural is what happens in nature, the sweet potato that we eat every day, that's actually been genetic engineered by the same agrobacterium that we use in our lab. It was done out in the wild 8,000 years ago. Hmm. All the butterflies you see out there, they're all genetically engineered by parasitic wasps. You know, so if you see uh, the non-GMO label on those foods, that little butterfly is actually a genetically engineered <laughs> butterfly. <laughs> of course, some people, you can't argue beliefs. I mean, someone just believes this is not right. I can't argue that. All I can do is give them the best scientific evidence that this is actually a better way to go than traditional methods. Well, you know, it's certainly a very precise way of going about it, as opposed to sort of blunt force that happens often in nature. You know, nature can be a brutal instrument, and this is, this is more like a scalpel of just changing exactly what needs to be changed. Absolutely. And, and that's why, again, for restoration purposes, that's so important because you don't want to change something that allows a tree to be adapted to the forest. At the risk of getting too technical for our audience, I'm curious, how did you guys go about identifying the nine genes? So when you look at the scope of work for this project and you realize there may be up to nine genes involved that express in order to, to allow it to be blight tolerant, how do you find those nine? Okay, so that was work done by the American Chestnut Foundation and some other uh, universities working together. Jared Westbrook is the leader of the breeding program. And he's really the one that's kind of done the calculations on breeding to find out after all these years, how many genetic loci are probably involved. So it's, it's kind of complicated. It's basically looking at how genes segregate okay. through each generation. But those particular genes aren't the gene that we're putting in with genetic engineering. The nice thing about genetic engineering is you don't have to rely on a species that can breed with your species. We can actually take from other species such as wheat. And this particular gene we use, the oxide oxygen gene, is actually very common in a lot of different species. It's found in all grains and many dicots also. So it, it's out there. You eat it all the time. And that's one of the things we like about it. Only thing is that our chestnut trees did not have it. So we can bring that thing in. We are looking at those nine genes from the Asian species. None of those will give you full resistance by themselves. You'd have to stack them. But we are starting to look at that, try to identify them. And the way you identify them is you look what genes are at those genetic loci for resistance. And there could be lots of them there. It could be 10 to 100 genes. And then you take those, you engineer them into a plant and see if you actually enhance resistance. And we've done that with a few. We saw we can bump up resistance a little bit. But again, it's, they're going to have to be stacked, and maybe combined with our oxide oxides. Dr. Powell, you've mentioned some other universities that you are partnering with, that you guys are, are working with. Give us a, a quick idea of how many are on your project team at your university, and then what other universities do you communicate with on this project on a regular basis? Okay, so on our team, we run between 20 to 25 people on there. Right now, I have like five full-time staff researchers and uh, one part-time. I have seven graduate students, and then every semester, the numbers change, but five to eight undergraduates working on the project also. During the summer, we also have high school students that come out and help with the project, too. So that's our core group here. But we work also with other faculty at ESF, Tom Horton for mycorrhizal stuff, James Gibbs for the wood frog stuff. We work with people at the University of Georgia, Scott Merkel. He does a lot of the uh, tissue culture with American chestnuts. We work with people at NC State, at Purdue, at the U.S. Forest Service. That's not a university, but still, it's a research group. So quite a few different places. I can't think of them all off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. 
Dr. Powell, quick follow-up on that. One of the frustrations that I've had when I've been collaborating with others on a big project before is we'll start overlapping and doing the same work. It's like, okay, we did that three weeks ago. Why didn't you ask before? You know, we've already run those tests. We've already acquired those resources. How do you guys keep from stepping over each other? How do you communicate and stay in sync? Yeah, so I think a lot of it is either through, like we do have phone conferences with our groups. We also, you know, we have several meetings a year where we get together and, and talk about it. There's this one group called the NE 1088, I think, or 1388. The number changes every year. It's a USDA research group that specializes in chestnut, and everybody presents what they've done in the past year. And uh, so if you kind of keep up with what everybody's doing, there's less chance that you're going to overlap. Where do you get your money? <laughs> to do all this. Who, who, who's so funding all this? Who's paid? A variety of sources. And, and the biggest funder and the longest term funder has been the American Chestnut Foundation. Initially with the New York chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation, they're actually the ones that approached us and asked us to do this project. Wow. And so they've been with us the whole time. We've gotten funding from New York State, actually from the state budget. We've got funding from regular granting agencies such as USDA. Now we have USDA BRAG grant, which is the Biotechnology Risk Assessment Grant. We've gotten money from NSF. We get private donations. We actually had crowdfunding campaigns where we raised over $100,000 in a crowdfunding campaign and, and uh, had donations from 48 of the 50 states in the United States. So, you know, it's a very popular project. We have had some corporate funding, but that's, you know, actually come back on us. But that's less than 4% of our total funding hmm. has been from corporations. And I would never take that back. Some people say, we should never done that. Well, I wouldn't because that actually started back um, when we were doing this project and we were getting a lot of funding from the state, New York State, and then 9-11 happened. Hmm. When 9-11 happened, all our state funding disappeared instantly. Hmm. And we actually had a, a company called Arbogen who came in and started giving us some funding, not the total funding that we lost, but some of the funding to help keep us going for a number of years. And then we, you know, that stopped and we went back to our regular funding sources. One of the things we talk about on this podcast now and then is if I had known then what I knew now, you mm -hmm. know, what I know now, what would you have done differently, if anything? That's interesting because um, the oxide oxidase gene that we use comes from wheat. And we only picked that one because it was the most studied at the time. There was a lot of publications on it. And you always want to go with something that's well known. But the genes found in lots of different plants. So that's kind of coming back to bite us because now when we go to the FDA, the FDA has a rule that if you have a food with wheat in it, you have to label it that it has wheat in it. Oh. And so even though it's only one gene out of over 30,000 genes, probably won't have to label it. But when we go to the regulatory place, we have to give a justification why we shouldn't have to regulate. You know, so if we picked it from corn or, you know, some other plant, mm. we wouldn't have that problem. It just, I just added some extra work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, the regulatory system isn't pure science. It's a lot of other things too. You mentioned the crowdfunding earlier. Is there a way that people can still get involved in this project? Absolutely. Well, the easiest way, of course, is to uh, join the American Chestnut Foundation because they're our biggest supporters. There you can actually volunteer and help with the project. But another thing that we're really trying to do right now is because we're going to probably be submitting our USDA petition sometime this fall, and there's going to be what's called an open comment period. And this is where the public can weigh in on this regulatory process. And what we really like to do is have people who want to restore the chestnut tree write in during that open comment period and let them know that, yeah, people want to plant these trees. This is an important tree. And so we're going to you know, be broadcasting this once it opens up and try to get as many people to help that way as possible. Dr. Powell, I have a question for you here. Um, as yes. we're looking at this whole project, fascinating thing about this to me is that it spans more than one generation. We're not going to see the forest restored in our lifetime to where they were in 1890. So what are you doing or what is the uh, American Chestnut Foundation doing to kind of prepare the next generation of people to take the baton here and continue the work? We always consider this as a century project hmm. to really kind of get a significant number of trees out there. It's going to take 100 years. And we're just kind of the spark to start it off. So what we are doing actually here at ESF, and I know that the American Chestnut Foundation does very similar things, is we try to talk to the public as much as possible. I give anywhere from 
10 to 20 public talks every year. You know, I've given webinars to third graders. Uh, I've had my students go to elementary school classes. We've worked with an author who wrote a book on the chestnut for middle school students. So we're, we're really trying to reach the next generation so that, you know, they will know these trees. It's kind of interesting. I always look at it this way. Our grandparents knew the chestnut tree. We did not, but our grandchildren will know it again. Before we go, I've got to ask you one question here. I assume that you've actually produced trees that have borne nuts, correct? That is absolutely correct. That's an important part of our research to make sure that this tolerance is inheritable from generation to generation. We've actually gone through three generations now with the chestnut. What we do is we've developed a method where we can get pollen from our genetically engineered trees in less than a year. And that's pretty significant because normally in a field, it would take you six, seven years to do crosses. But since we can do that in less than a year, we can take that pollen and then we grow what we call wild type mother trees and we cross with those trees and we collect the nuts and half the nuts will inherit the blight tolerance gene. Okay, so we've done that. We've taken the offspring, we've tested those, we grew those up, made pollen, again, crossed them and, and so on and so forth. And we actually have a plan with the American Chestnut Foundation to go through like five different generations to make sure that we don't have any, it's called linkage drag, make sure that we have a lot of diversity and local adaptation for, for different regions of the chestnut. So we got this big breeding program that they're going to be continuing on for the next probably decades. Okay, let me tell you why I ask you that question, because... As somebody who has actually tasted chestnuts that have been roasted over an open <laughs> fire and tasted how scrumptious they are, have you done a taste test with these new nuts from the blight-resistant trees? Excellent question. And I will probably be one of the first to actually eat them, but right now we do not, only because they are too precious to eat. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, last year we harvested around 700 nuts, and we used every one of them oh. in our experiments or in our planting for the production of orchards and stuff. So, you know, until we start having an overabundance, we won't be doing that. We have to send nuts out for nutritional testing and things like that. So, no, I haven't taken any and eaten it yet, but I probably will be the first. <laughs> we want to hear back uh, how, yes. they, how they taste once you, once you do that. Hey, how can people get in touch with you and learn more about the American Chestnut Foundation? Okay, so we have a website here at ESF, just basically... Go to www.esf.edu slash chestnut. And that gets you to our website, tells you all about what we do here at ESF. And if you're interested in the American Chestnut Foundation, they have a website, which is, of course, www.acf.org. And in there, you can uh, find out all the things they do, as well as how you can join up to the state chapter if you're interested. Well, Dr. Powell, thank you so much for being with us to share your expertise. Bill, as always, thank you for your part. And Andy, so wonderful to have you back and finding this wonderful conversation that we could have. This has been a good one. Thank you, Nick. And one more thing, Dr. Powell, you may have seen this right here. This is our Manage This coffee mug we're going to send to you with our thanks for being our guest today. Wow. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is fun. I always like talking about Chestnut. We'd like to thank our listeners as well for the comments you've sent us about our podcasts. Please continue to leave your comments on Google, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or whichever podcast listening app you use. You can also leave us a message on our website, velociteach.com, or on social media. We want to know what you're thinking. And of course, most of us are always thinking about how to earn PDUs, professional development units, toward your recertifications. And by listening to this podcast, you've already picked some up. To claim your free PDUs, go to VelociTeach.com and choose Manage This Podcast from the top of the page. Click the button there that says Claim PDUs, and then click right through the steps. That's it for this episode of Manage This. We hope you'll tune back in on December 4th for our next edition. So until next time, keep calm and manage this. <laughs>